Wonderful. So uh, thank you everybody for attending. I'm going to say a few uh, what I hope are very quick words as an introduction here, and then I'll turn things over uh, to our panelists. Um, <clears throat> so this, as you probably almost certainly know at this point, uh, this webinar is focused on web accessibility, which is an issue that I think LSE cares uh, very deeply about. Um, we did a major assessment of the statewide legal information websites that are either uh, managed by an LSE grantee or an LSE grantee uh, participates in as part of a broader community of folks managing the websites. Um, and that assessment had nine focus areas. And I would say one of the most prominent focus areas, both in terms of doing the evaluation, but then also kind of talking about the evaluation after it was over, whether it was with our LSE board or at a conference, uh, was this topic of web accessibility. And um, our, our report and our toolkit covered a, a range of uh, th kind of things about web accessibility, but I would say the two most important takeaways were, uh, first, this is an area where there's a lot of opportunity for improvement among most legal aid websites. Um, that's not a knock on the legal aid community. A lot of sites out there struggle with this, the, the issue of accessibility and making their site accessible to folks um, who are dealing with a disability. Uh, but at least among legal aid sites, there's also a, a lot of opportunity to improve. Uh, the second major takeaway uh, that came from our evaluators, as well as directly from the website community, was the folks were very interested in learning more about this topic. Um, people kind of, you know, knew a little bit about Section 508 guidelines or the WCAG guidelines or some of the other ones that were out there, uh, but they didn't really have a, an extensive understanding of what those guidelines meant and how you could actually apply them to your website. And so one of the things we took away from the assessment was we wanted to do more around training and tools around web accessibility and this webinar here today is one of our kind of first attempts to uh, make this information more available to the legal aid community. Um, so on our webinar, we have two uh, great panelists. Uh, both work for Rheingold Incorporated. Uh, Rheingold is a digital agency that's based outside of DC. They work on a broad range of uh, website and, and technology projects, and they're um, they're currently working with LSC. Uh, we're a client of Ryan Gold's on a major initiative to develop a flood preparation and response website in the Midwest, which has been a, a really interesting project. We're about six months into it. And if, if you're in that region, you'll probably hear more about that uh, really soon. Um, I've been very impressed with the uh, the depth of their, uh, their expertise um, around web design and development, but also around issues like web accessibility and, and usability. Uh, so I'm very happy that they're able to come on and give this presentation here today. Um, and with that, I think, Faith, Allison, I'll turn things over to you and let you take things over. All right, great. Um, so this is Faith here. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today as we talk about accessibility on the web. Um, we are really excited to be sharing this presentation, and so we appreciate you setting aside your time for us. Um, before we start, just one quick note, uh, we'll be providing a transcript after this presentation for anyone who was unable to join or was unable to listen in. Um, we want to mention that now because we'll be referencing tools you can use and websites you might want to visit later on in the presentation. So if you don't want to write all of those down as we're talking, you'll be able to find those in the transcript as well. And before I go any further, um, I just want to pause and, and introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Faith Laminac, and I'm a senior user experience designer at Rheingold. Um, and my role in a typical project here is to ensure that when we design a website, that we understand the audience who will use that site and that what we design meets the, that audience's needs and is as easy and enjoyable to use as possible. Um, with me is Allison, who I'll let introduce herself. Hello, I'm Allison Karnwas. Um, I'm the Director of Front-End Technology here at Rheingold. Um, and I'm on the team that basically uh, translates designs into code and then uh, makes it appear correctly in your browser. So our talk today has three major portions. Um, first, we'll be talking about what accessibility means and what it includes. Second, we'll be talking about how it's measured on websites. And third, we'll be talking about some of the overall results and benefits of creating an accessible website. So to begin with, what does accessibility mean? 
Well, let's start with how accessibility is defined by the WC3, which stands for the World Wide Web Consortium. This group's purpose is to develop the protocols, guidelines, and specifications for the web code itself, which browsers then implement. So they're kind of an authority in this area. According to the W3C, accessibility means that people with disabilities can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with websites and tools. It also means that they can contribute equally without barriers. There are also some other terms that you might hear that kind of fall into the same realm as accessibility and that we'll be mentioning throughout the presentation. So let's talk about two of those terms next. So first, um, we want to talk about user experience design, which may sound familiar as this is my job title. Um, in general, user experience design is focused on improving the usability of sites. As the W3C defines it, usability is about designing products to be effective, efficient, and satisfying. And the next term is inclusive design. So inclusion is about diversity and assuring the involvement of everyone to the greatest extent possible. In some regions, this is also referred to as universal design and design for all, and it addresses a broad range of issues, some of which could be considered accessibility, but also include other things like a consideration for literacy and geographic location. So our talk today is going to focus primarily on the subject of accessibility, but accessible best practices can also cross over into the usability and inclusion category. So you'll hear us refer back to these terms at times as well. So um, to start talking about this, you know, the, the idea of accessibility, um, we're going to talk about how the these design approaches kind of work in practice. Um, and let's start by actually thinking about the physical space, since the way we approach accessibility on the web is kind of similar. So in the physical space, uh, we can start by asking the question, what do we need to do to allow people to participate? So let's say that we had a store. What do we need to do to allow people to shop at our store? The first thing we need to do is to navigate people to our location. So let's assume that they'll be driving a car to get there. So what's the first thing you do when your GPS says you've arrived? You look for a parking spot. So sometimes this is not the most joyous of tasks, uh, and people may get frustrated with the lack of parking and drive away. So to make our store more usable, maybe we'll invest in a parking lot. So now fewer people will drive away. However, just because our store is more usable does not mean that it's accessible. We still need to consider people with disabilities that may be driving away out of frustration because though there's parking available now, there's only spots left in the back because our store is so popular, of course. Uh, maybe they're driving away because they aren't able to walk, walk long distances, or maybe they use a wheelchair and the parking lot is still too tough to navigate. So we reserve some special parking places for them to reduce the amount of walking, and we provide a space for the wheelchair lift to operate. So now our store is more accessible to people who have mobility issues. So now let's think about people who maybe don't have a car and took the subway system to our store. Here in D.C. we call it the Metro. So what has their journey looked like so far? So the Metro in DC is pretty accessible to a lot of different audiences. For people who are deaf, there are a lot of visual indicators to let them know what station they're at, like the station signs, LED signs on the train itself. Um, and then on some of the new cars, there's screens that provide a lot of information, like what station is next, and alerts, like elevator outages. And then on the platform itself, there's blinking lights on the edge of the platform to give them a heads up that the train is incoming. For people who are blind, there's audio announcements at each station, and there's safety features, like on the edge of the platform, there's bumps to warn them that they're close to the edge. Um, and then there's barriers between the cars so they don't head that way thinking it's an open door. So all of these features combined allow the metro to be safely accessible to a wide audience. So getting back to our store, now that our customers are in the right vicinity, how do, how do we get our potential customers in the front door? Easy, just walk up the steps. But wait, what about those customers that were in the wheelchair? We'll put in a ramp. Now our, door, our front door is easily accessible. So then when our customers get close to our store, we want them to know which door they should go in. Typically, that means that we should put up a sign. But what about people who have vision problems? They won't be able to see that sign. So let's add some braille to the sign so that they, too, can confirm that they're accessing the store that they're expecting. 
So our customer's journey isn't complete. They only just entered the store. But let's stop here and take some of these considerations that we've learned about here over to the digital space. And just a heads up, this will get a little technical as we move forward. Um, we know that you aren't all developers and designers, but hopefully this can help you start the conversation with your web team. Um, we also understand that a lot of you went through an audit recently, as David mentioned. Um, so hopefully some of these terms and concepts are familiar. So we can think about accessibility in the digital space similarly to how we think about it in the physical space. We'll need to address a similar set of questions or needs that our users might have as they're visiting our website. So, for example, how will they navigate on our site? Can they get to where they want to go? Do they understand the content The content being presented? Overall, what do we need to do to allow people to participate? So let's start with that navigation question. Just like in the physical space with the car versus the metro, there's a lot of different considerations depending on the method of navigation. A lot of people navigate by clicking links using their mouse. But what if they're on their tablet or phone? They wouldn't use a mouse. They would tap with their finger on a link that they want to navigate to. And as I'm sure you've experienced, when you visit a site on your phone that's a little on the older side and the links are teeny tiny, it's kind of frustrating to interact with, right? So now think about how much of an annoyance that would be for someone who may have an issue with their fine motor control, who may not be able to use a mouse precisely or hit a small target. So a common solution we use when designing a site is to make sure anything that's interactive is big enough for a finger to tap on so that a user doesn't miss or tap something that they didn't mean to. The rule of thumb <laughs> is that the tappable area should be no smaller than 44 pixels by 44 pixels. So not only does this larger target help the usability for people who use touch devices, but it gives people with limited mobility a more accessible experience. Another option for someone with limited mobility is to use their keyboard for navigation. Using your keyboard, you can use arrow keys to scroll on a site like you would do with a scroll wheel on your mouse. However, like with a mouse, an interactive element needs to be specifically targeted in order to interact with it. With a mouse, in order to target something, you point to it and click to engage with it. But with a keyboard, there's a slightly different way to target elements, referred to as changing the current page's focus. To bring an element into focus with a keyboard, you can press the tab key to navigate between interactive elements, and an indicator will show you what element is currently in focus. In the slide, it's showing the default focus indi indicator, a glowing blue outline. So once something is in focus, you can engage with it in different ways depending on what it is, but most of the time you use the enter key to simulate a click. So one of the common issues we see that limits the accessibility of keyboard navigation is when the default focus indicator is removed because it's not super pretty, and then a style that matches the rest of the site is added in after. That's not inherently a bad thing, but sometimes by removing that global style, some elements may be missing a focus style, or sometimes a style that replaces the default isn't prominent enough for a user to notice and understand where they're currently focused. So if the global style is to be removed, one of the quick fix kind of tricks that we sometimes use is to make our focus state the same as our hover state, as long as it's prominent enough and makes sense in the context. So now, what about users who don't see well? How do they interact with the site? So the degree to which people can see varies widely, and there are considerations to think about when it comes to the design of our website to make sure that everyone can access the information we're presenting. So making text larger is a simple but effective way to engage with an audience who may have issues seeing fine details. They can also benefit from the color of the text having a higher contrast ratio to the background. So for example, in this image here, the lime green text on a white background is hard to see since those two colors don't differ in contrast enough, but that same lime green color on a black background is much clearer because they have a higher contrast ratio. In addition to simple clarity of vision, we also need to consider users who may be colorblind. There are a lot of different kinds of colorblindness, and there are different considerations for each kind, but at the core, increasing the color contrast makes text easier to read for everyone. So taking a look at the last piece of text on this slide, the green background with blue text may be all right, if not great, for someone who is not colorblind to see. But if we test it on a site that can simulate colorblindness, applying what is referred to as a blue-blind filter, we can see that suddenly our green text is now blue, and that last block is that last block is blue on blue now, which is much harder to see. 
So as a catch-all, it's good to test your sight in grayscale, as shown here. This is what someone who is completely colorblind would see. That last block got even tougher to read. And this is because the contrast ratio between the text color and the background color is not significant enough. Um, there are also tools you can use to run through these scenarios and check color usage on your own site, and we'll tell you more about those later on in the presentation. So, in addition to text readability, people who are colorblind may also have trouble, trouble understanding elements that depend on color to communicate an idea. So, for example, they may be frustrated attempting to understand a bar graph where the bars are brown, yellow, green, and red without any additional distinguishing features especially if, when referencing the graph, one of the bars is referred to by color only. So in this slide, you can see um, what this bar graph looks like in full color on the left versus what it looks like to someone who is redlined on the right. If a description of this graph refers to the brown bar, it would be impossible for someone who is redlined to know which bar that is. We can fix this by adding labels in each bar that we can then use to refer to instead of only referring to the color. So in this example, we could refer to a bar as item two. And then to further differentiate each bar, a pattern was also applied, which really helps each bar stand out against one another, something that only color was doing before. But what about users who are entirely blind? Um, the web is 2D, which obviously means that we can't add Braille, like we might in the physical space. So people who are blind often use assistive technologies, such as a screen reader, to help them navigate their computer. There's many different types of software that are available to assist blind users, um, and though they vary in their capabilities at their core, a screen reader does what it sounds like. It reads what's on the screen aloud to a user. Most operating systems have this technology baked in. Um, you can visit the accessibility section of your settings on your phone or laptop to check it out. So communicating a visual message to a user on a screen reader can, can be pretty challenging. What's the old saying, a uh, picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, but if a user can't see a picture, words are going to have to do. Uh, so keep in mind, the goal of accessibility means that we want to engage with our blind users equally. So all visual messaging should be communicated, not just the important things, but silly puns and implied jokes, too. So on an image in web code, or HTML, there's a concept of providing alternative text on what's referred to as an alt attribute for the purposes of describing the image to someone who cannot otherwise see it. These alt attributes are not visible to users who can see the images, so it's something that you're providing kind of under the hood through code to screen readers. So adding alt images, like the one shown here, uh, to your, uh, can be relatively low-hanging fruit to improve the accessibility of your site, but heads up, things like charts, graphs, and infographics can be particularly challenging to provide an equal experience due to their complex nature. So leveraging something as structurally simple as an alt attribute to try and describe such a complex image can be kind of limiting. But there's a rich library of different kinds of tags that websites are built from. There's specific tags for a lot of different things, like an OL tag is for an ordered list, and have LI tags inside of them for each list item. To help screen readers read a site most effectively at the core, the HTML that the site is built with needs to be semantic, meaning that the code itself should be descriptive of its purpose. So don't use a P tag, which is for paragraph, or a list. Use an OL tag. So getting back to those complex visualizations, providing a semantic description in addition to that alt tag can help to communicate more complex ideas and relationships accurately with the availability of headings, lists, and paragraph tags outside of that alt attribute. And that semantic code should be used across the site, not just in cases of visualization or, or images. So in this slide, we're showing a popover box, which shows up on top of the content of your page. So in an effort to make the code for this popover accessible, you might try to find a semantic HTML tag, maybe called something like popover, but unfortunately, there are not codes explicitly for all purposes. So in that case, there's additional code attributes that can be added, including ARIA and role attributes, which can be used to provide additional cues to the screen readers for how to read it. So for example, they can be leveraged to communicate labels for things that might have a visual indicator. In the example on the slide, the button in the top right looks like an X, but in the code, there's no actual text within the button uh, for a screen reader to read, 
So it would just skip over it or maybe say that there's an unlabeled button existing, but that doesn't really help your user know what it's for. So we've added an aria label equals close, which the screen reader will read instead as a button labeled close, which allows the user to understand what controls are available to them. Additionally, the HTML shown here is also describing our popover as role equals dialog to help communicate to the screen reader that this element is sitting on top of the page. So ARIA attributes can do a lot of things, including describing when something's currently hidden on the page so that a screen reader doesn't read it, or to help understand the relationship between two elements, like saying something is labeled by another element. So there's a lot of different types of ARIA attributes and role attributes that you can assign in your code, but the first step is HTML, making that semantic first and then supplementing it with these attributes as necessary. And actually, additional labeling can sometimes be detrimental to a, a screen reader user if things are identified well in the code already and then have additional ARIA attributes added on top of that. It might actually be read out several times to the user, adding kind of noise and clutter. So while ARIA attributes are useful, only use them if they're needed to improve the user's understanding of the site. So like we talked about previously when accommodating keyboard navigation, it's also important to screen readers that interactive elements are coded in a way that it can also identify that they are interactive. So for example, someone with a screen reader might tell it to read me all the links on a web page, and we want to make sure that the code is written so that all of the links will in fact be read. Um, on that note, the content on the site, the actual writing, can also be improved for screen reader understanding. So take, for example, that read me all the links prompt. If every link on your page says read more, how would a user know what they want to interact with without having the entire page read to them from top to bottom? Um, so being descriptive in the interactive elements is not just important in this scenario, but it also helps sighted users confirm that they're headed where they want to go. Instead of using learn more as a call to action, using something like find out your flood risk helps all users, not just those using a screen reader, to know what to expect should they click that link. And continuing to talk about content on your site, accessibility standards advise that the information on your website be organized and written in a way that's easy to follow. Um, and that is not to say that you should cut your message short because, as I just mentioned, um, being descriptive is sometimes needed. But you should avoid jargon, be as concise as possible, and organize your content in a way that is easy to skim. Some of the ways that you can make content more skimmable is by using headings, bullets, and keeping paragraphs short. This helps users to take a breath and to find the information they are most interested in quickly with less frustration. So as you can see in the two images in the slide, um, these are two versions of the same web page, and they both communicate the same information. The version on the right, however, uses shorter paragraphs, bullets, and visual space to make the content easier to follow. And then that same line of thinking, it also helps users to internalize your message if the language itself is simple, like you would use in your day-to-day -day conversation. So the rule of thumb is to write web content at a reading level consistent with sixth to eighth grade to make sure that the broadest audience can understand what you're trying to communicate to them and you're not talking over them. So we've talked a lot about different audiences with varying disabilities, and the last group that we want to talk, today, talk about today are the deaf users. So in general, the web is a pretty visual place, which means that it's pretty accommodating to deaf users, with the exception of audio cues and communications. So engaging a deaf user with your video content can be as simple as adding captions or maybe for your podcast, you can provide a transcript, like we're doing with this presentation. To further engage deaf users, consider providing a visual indication of audio beyond just which words were spoken, but how they were said. This screenshot was from a video where a kitten was meowing, and the video had these three little lines animate to show the cadence of the meow, which you know really helped to emphasize that kitten's cuteness, and you didn't even need to hear it aloud. So maybe you don't have cute kittens meowing in your videos, but this concept can also be achieved by using a sign language interpreter who can use facial expressions and body language to emphasize what is otherwise only communicated through someone's voice, such as tone and cadence. So 
So we talked about some of the most common problems that we regularly address as we design and develop websites, and there are a lot to keep track of. So let's talk a bit now about how to find problem areas on your site and determine how it measures up. So in the world of web development, in the world of web development, you'll commonly hear people talk about 508 compliance. Um, this was an amendment that applies to all federal agencies and their electronic and communication, uh, electronic and information technology communication. So the amendment applies to information beyond just the traditional website, though. It also applies, uh, applies to things like emails, Word documents, and PDFs. Basically, anything that's delivered to another person electronically. And due to that broad spectrum of applications, the amendment is also pretty broad and open to interpretation. But at its core, federal agencies must give employees with disabilities and members of the public access to information that's comparable to the access available to others. So while 508 is a good guideline for best practices, no one other than the government is actually legally required to comply, at least from a federal standpoint. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, sometimes referred to as WCAG, is a publication by the W3C we mentioned before. Within these guidelines, there are three levels of compliance, the least stringent being level A, the most stringent being triple A. And these guidelines are specific to the web, and they overlap with 508, which is recently updated to indicate that on the web, it should correlate with double A WCAG compliance. So, for example, when presenting a video to a user, level A compliance would necessitate that there's a text-based alternative, for example, a transcript relative uh, of the video content. For double A compliance, the accessibility improves a little bit, and it states that there should be synchronized captions available to the user. For triple A, the most accessible guideline, a sign language interpretation would be provided for that video. So with such a wide array of guidelines, it's important to test your site in a variety of different ways, both quantitatively and qualitatively. So there are many different tools that will crawl over a web page and provide a report of how it measures up. So we'll show you a few of the most popular ones. Um, some of these tools were likely used to generate that audit on your site. The first one here is Google Lighthouse. It's a Chrome extension that will run many different audits on your site, including accessibility. Um, and it'll provide information around any failing code and where that code exists in your page. Axe is another Chrome extension um, that specifically runs an accessibility audit and provides clear instructions for how to improve any violations. And then to test something like color contrast, there's a lot of different tools that you can leverage in similar ways. Uh, this slide in particular is showing the Web Aim Contrast Checker, um, where you can provide your foreground and background colors. And it will indicate what the current mathematical ratio of those two colors are and which of the WCAG compliance levels it passes or fails. So there are different guidelines between a normal text size and a large text size. So with large text, the contrast doesn't have to measure it strongly because it's larger, which compensates for some of that visibility. So on this slide, we're measuring the blue color as our foreground, or our text color, against a white background. This contrast ratio is 8.59 to 1, which passes double A guidelines as well as triple A guidelines for both normal and large text. So while the quantitative testing tools are great to get a start on improving the accessibility of the site, it's also important to test from a qualitative perspective. And getting qualitative feedback on our sites is important because we can check the boxes and try to meet accessibility standards, but we need to make sure that we actually help users and don't put them in a frustrating or bad situation, as you can see on the images in these slides. Um, we want to make sure that users are able to achieve their goals effectively and without frustration. And this is where qualitative testing uh, really comes into play. So the go-to method for getting qualitative feedback on a website is usability testing. And at its core, a usability test simply involves asking someone to pull up a website and complete a series of tasks that represent the major goals users need to be able to accomplish on that site. And then as they attempt to accomplish these tasks, you can note what questions they have, where they get confused, and anything that blocks them from achieving their goals. After using web tools like the ones we just talked through to audit your site, running a usability test of your site with someone using a screen reader, for example, will give you a fuller picture of how accessible your site truly is. 
And outside of all of these more official audits and tasks, there are other ways of getting quick feedback on a site. So one thing you can do is just get a fresh set of eyes on it. Um, you and your team have likely been looking at your own website forever, and you know exactly where, what to look for and where to find it. Um, but what about a new user? Will they understand what to look for? Will they even be able to see the primary call to action that to you may seem very obvious? And a quick way to test this is just to phone a friend, ask someone who hasn't seen the site what they think. Similar to user testing, just at a smaller scale, you can gain valuable insight just by getting some fresh eyes on it. And asking someone like a parent or grandparent, like in this slide, may also afford you insights into many of the things we've talked about. Is the text large enough? Are the touch targets large enough? And is the content easy to follow? Um, we also talked earlier about how it's helpful to have organized sites and organized content. And a quick way to see if a page on a website is visually organized is just to take a few steps back from your computer screen, literal steps back, and ask yourself if the page still seems organized at this further view. What stands out on the page? Is that what should be standing out? Another way to check this is to squint so the page becomes blurry and ask the same question. Can you still see an organizational pattern on the page, or does everything sort of blend together into one blob? If so, it might be a page that could use headers or lists to better organize the content and break up the text. The text. And obviously, neither of these tasks are going to catch every issue and should not be the only way that we assess sites. But we just found that it's helpful to be gathering feedback on our work all throughout a website design process in as many ways as possible to catch as many issues as we can. And with that, we just gotta pause and take a breath. We've given you a lot of information, and while we really hope that you're excited to go right out there and implement everything that we just talked about, um, there are probably some of you that are feeling overwhelmed or a bit nervous about this newly discovered pile of work that we just gave you. So it's, we just want to say that it's important to take this one step at a time. When you go back to your desk, you can run a quick squint test and see if any glaring issues stand out to you. Or you can think back to any feedback you may have heard from actual users of your website. That feedback may indicate problem areas, and it's a great place to start when looking for updates and improvements that you can make to your site. So just remember that each step forward, even if it's seemingly small, means that your site is accessible to more people. Okay, and so we mentioned at the beginning that making your site more accessible can have effects on people outside of the targeted audience who have disabilities. And this is because accessibility, usability, and inclusive design are related. Accessible practices can improve the usability of a website for everyone, including people facing situational limitations. And we'll show you some examples of this in a minute. Um, accessible practices can also support inclusion by creating better experiences for people in rural areas, for example. So those ramps that we put in at our store, lots of people can benefit from them, not just those that are in a wheelchair. People with strollers or a shopping cart. And keep in mind, if you break your leg and are temporarily in a wheelchair, you would benefit too. Bringing that into the digital space, uh, when you're in a public place and you can't find your headphones but still want to enjoy a video, having captions is really nice. Or when the internet is spotty or slow, images and videos take a lot longer to load than text does. The content that's in your alt tag can appear in place of the image that fails to load, which allows users to continue to engage with your content even when the images are not visible. And as we mentioned earlier, to make your site accessible, content should be organized. And that organized content likely ends up benefiting every website visitor you have. For all website users, a wall of text without headings and that's difficult to skim is overwhelming and makes the process of using that website more difficult. And the same goes for the simple language concept. This supports inclusive design by making your website better for people with low literacy. And in general, people will be more likely to stay on a website that uses simple terms and labels to make the process of getting to the information they need easier and faster. And this is especially true for people who are in a time of crisis. If you are looking for a hospital's address, for example, you probably don't have time to read through complex text. And this is likely true of some visitors to LSD websites as well, who may be going through a stressful situation. Those visitors are going to benefit from clear and simple language that helps them find your phone number, for example, as quickly and easy as possible, 
even in a moment of crisis. And those accessible best practices don't just help your human users, but it helps the robots too. Search engines like Google have specifically downgraded results that don't provide what they consider a good experience for their users. This includes a good mobile experience, as well as good results on our accessibility test. So more semantic HTML leads, leads to better automated understanding of content. It provides a clear site architecture and navigation path and allows the search engines to crawl through the site, taking note of the content so that they can return results more effectively when someone search, searches for a term. Normally, rich media like videos and images may not be able to be read by search engines due to their format. So this means if someone has searched for legal aid programs for low-income Americans, they may not find that Senate briefing video on your site that they were looking for in their search results. So the artificial intelligence in search engines is improving. To understand what the subjects are in a photo or video, it's still not super reliable. But by providing captions and transcripts for videos and good alt tags in your images, you can help improve their interpretation by a search engine as well as for your users. And good news, that search, uh, the Senate briefing video that I referenced earlier, it had captions, I checked. <laughs> but a quick caveat. Optimizing a site for search engines, addressing usability, and designing for inclusivity alone will not address all accessibility issues. A focus on specific accessibility needs is still important. So in closing, as you're working on your site, don't forget to ask the question, what do we need to do to allow people with disabilities to engage equally with an experience? And with that, we can go ahead and open the floor to any questions. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've covered a lot of content here. Um, what what are your thoughts on some of the um, automated uh, checkers that are out there that uh, like wave that give um, feedback on a site is is that um, a useful first step for people or um, how accurate are those tools that type of stuff yeah um, there are a ton of tools to test all this stuff um, wave wave is another good example um, I think that they in particular have a pretty good interface for the color contrast checker, um, but not all tools catch all things. Um, so if you want to be, you know, really be broad in your in your um, accessibility of your site, you should run it through multiple testers um, as well as the qualitative testing, as we mentioned. It's absolutely a great first step, though, um, running it through just just a simple test uh, and seeing what pops up. It'll catch the most glaring issues right off the bat, for sure. Excellent. Um, so with regards to videos and creating transcripts, um, what what kind of tips do you have for doing that? Because I know a lot of the um, legal aid organizations are starting to use um, YouTube as a way to distribute self-help content. Yeah, so um, YouTube has some tools available to caption your videos. Um, they also do have some automated captioning uh, kind of in their interface. That being said, I don't know if you've ever tried it out, but sometimes you get some really funny results because it is automated. Um, the, the highest quality uh, captioning, the highest quality transcript would be somebody manually going through and making sure that it's correct. Um, but there's kind of some, you know, quick shortcuts you can take um, to get at least the first draft done. Um, for example, in this uh, this presentation, uh, we had written out some notes and we're basically going to go back uh, once we get this recording and fill out our transcripts, um, just kind of scrubbing through, filling in our notes um, as we talk through them. So it's unfortunately, it is a bit of overhead, um, but it is, you know, a, a great way to make it accessible for deaf users. Um, and then, you know, I appreciate it when I'm on the Metro and can't load or uh, can't listen to my, my headphones. It's great for uh for people who don't have their speakers turned on. Excellent, thank you. Um, what is a good tip for creating clear alt text for links? So um, 
are you referring to uh, images, alt text on images, or for the um, the content in like a call to action link? Um, so e either one of those. I, I was, um, I believe the question was targeted at images, but uh, both those use cases are useful. Yeah. So for images, um, it's really uh, you want to make sure that you capture why you're using that image, what somebody who is cited would, um, how they would benefit from that image. Um, so for example, you know, you might say. Um, you know, that, that image that I showed was of a woman holding, you know, a young child, um, and it helped kind of reinforce the relationship that was being described in uh, the content itself of the article. So you might say something like, you know, Mrs. Johnson was, you know, snuggling with Elizabeth, you know, or something like that, um, to describe the image in a way that you can, you can understand how it helps um, reinforce the content and how it relates to that content as well. Um, you might use the same image for another, uh, you know, another article, and that alt text might change um, because now the context is different, and you use that image to enforce a different point. Um, so it's really, you know, if you closed your eyes and you know somebody told you, "I saw this image," you know, if it's guy in a baseball cap, like that doesn't tell me a whole lot about, you know, about why you used it or how it relates. Um, so it's really, uh, it's most important to be kind of contextual um, and, and descriptive. Um, I don't think that you can be too descriptive for one of these images. Okay. And then if there's links, so. Yeah, for, for the second half of that, which is sort of writing um, descriptive link text, um, the, the versions that we see of this most of the time are sort of find more, read more, learn more, see more, and oftentimes it's just as simple as adding the about, so whatever the answer to that question is, learn more about, read more about, um, oftentimes just adding that alone is a great first step to making sure that that link text is, is descriptive enough. So do you have any examples you can share about a particular organization who's received feedback on how to improve their website, and then it had an impact on individuals or groups. I think it's mostly um, the, the kind of feedback that we'll see as more ad hoc. It's not usually, you know, super formal. Um, but we'll notice, you know, somebody might say, "How did you find that? I, I was never able to find that on the site." You know, and that to me says, "Well, okay, so maybe the navigational paths that we're giving to our users, or the buttons that we're leading." to this page aren't descriptive enough so they don't know where to go to find some content. Um, something, you know, it, it's usually, you know, if you're looking at a website and somebody says, wait, how did you do that? Um, that's usually an indicator that, you know, they didn't understand how to use it or they couldn't access it themselves. Um, that kind of feedback usually happens in a more ad hoc fashion. Um, but if you've got something, you know, like a, a lot of sites have a little like, do you have feedback, you know, kind of prompts or something like that? Um, that's also a way to collect that um, kind of stuff. Um, if you've got analytics on your site and your primary call to action is not being clicked on, that's an indicator that maybe something needs to be addressed there. Um, you know, nobody's interacting with this part of the site. That doesn't mean that that part of the site is wrong. It might be, it just needs to be jiggered a little bit so that people can interpret it better or get to it better. Yeah, and, with, and it's interesting because with accessibility, often the user will just give up and leave the site because they're not going to assume that the feedback form is accessible. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's an unfortunate, you know, accessibility literally is about access. Um, so if something isn't able to be accessed, um, they're not going to know that it exists to give feedback about it. So mm -hmm. that's where that qualitative testing really comes into play a lot, I think. Um, you know, putting it in front of somebody who's actually using a screen reader um, or reading, you know, turning on your voiceover on your computer and listening to what it sounds like to somebody who might be using a screen reader. Um, you can you can identify some, you know, problem areas pretty quick. Mm -hmm. It is definitely a different experience, I will say that. So we've got two questions here relating to ARIA. First, what does it stand for? And then someone would like to hear um, more about ARIA attributes and mobile devices. Yeah, so ARIA is one of those ones that everybody talks about ARIA and nobody knows what it stands for. I think it's something along the lines of accessible 
rich uh, internet application, I think is what it is. I looked it up right before this and I it emptied right out of my brain. Um, but it's A-R-I-A. Um, and there's, there is a ton of different attributes. Um, I think the most common ones that I've seen are labeled by. So something that, you know, maybe a tooltip pops up on your site. Um, that button and that tooltip, the button that you use to open that tooltip and the tooltip itself in code can be miles apart on the page. So um, you can say, hey, this tooltip is labeled by that button. So a screen reader kind of knows to draw that relationship so that if somebody clicks on that button, they know which tooltip is related and, and that that should now be read. Um, there's, I don't know, there's a ton of them. Um, the hidden one I mentioned, um, sometimes it's not super clear in the code what's visible on the page versus what's hidden. Um, so you can say like, hey, screen reader, don't worry about this. Um, it's hidden right now. Um, somebody who's sighted wouldn't see it either. Um, there's, let's see, I think that there's um, indicators to, uh, for, for like if it's an application or a tool on your page um, to indicate that it's kind of a widget on your page and it's kind of separate from everything else. Um, it might be more interactive so that it knows to kind of pay attention more to that and things that are changing within that. Maybe you've got some script running on your site that's changing out content or something like that, and there can be an ARIA label to um, point that out to the screen reader so they know to pay attention to that. Um, as far as mobile goes, um, there's not a super strong relationship between ARIA labels and mobile specifically. Um, ARIA labels really are mostly for screen reader accessibility, um, and then um, any other automated, you know, crawling of the site. Um, but mobile, um, kind of along the accessibility side of things, um, oftentimes your mobile site is the most simple version of your site. So when you're looking at how to make your site accessible, it's often easy to take a, take a peek at what it looks like in mobile. Um, and if there's problem areas in mobile, it's likely, you know, a complicated situation that you might want to um, pay attention to, particularly around accessibility. Um, like we mentioned with the task targets and stuff like that, um, that's something that, you know, if it's, if it's accessible in mobile, it's accessible in desktop as well. But there's not a, a super strong relationship between ARIA and mobile specifically. Yeah, there, there was a comment here um, with regards to um, uh, the fourth to sixth grade reading levels, um, just the importance of actual um, client testing there, because uh, the, even our colleagues often have kind of a background around law and don't realize what terms we're using. Um, there's also a community tool called um, Read Clearly or Write Clearly um, that will audit your website and show you uh, common alternatives to some of that language that we're taught in law school that actually doesn't help clients. Um, well, it, it, it's hard. I would just add uh, one of the concerns that I often hear about plain language in the legal context is it, it's so hard to get to a fourth grade level or a sixth grade level because you're throwing in these specific legal terms, which are <laughs> clearly not at a fourth to sixth grade level. Um, I think one of the latest versions of Write Clearly actually allows you to filter out legal terms. So you can mm -hmm. still see if the rest of your language is presented in, in plain English, um, you know, without that, uh, you know, a unlawful detainer having to be in there because that's a term you're going to have to tell the judge um, in skewing the results of your uh, analysis of the, the readability of the material. Very good point. And, and to that point, you know, if you guys have a lot of legal terms in your, in your content, you know, while the legal term itself may be complicated, you can kind of help the framing of that word saying, you know, you might hear something like, you know, this phrase or, you know, look out for the form that's labeled this. This is, you know, this is what it's for. Or, um, you know, you can kind of help the frame of that so that um, the actual legal term itself doesn't scare people off or confuse them. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's a, a question that's a bit more on the technical side. Um, how do the ARIA attributes work with the Drupal CMS? Yeah, so it'll it'll depend on your theme and uh, which plugins that you're using. Um, something like Bootstrap, uh, which is kind of a foundational piece for a lot of different websites, 
um, will come with ARIA labels already. Um, but again, I, the ARIA labels are only, you know, kind of the last stretch. Uh, really the core of it, you want to make sure that your HTML is solid um, and that your content is solid. The ARIA labels are kind of just to, they're band-aids, more or less, um, to fix problem areas. Um, so don't think that you need to add ARIA labels for every single little thing. Um, if, if your HTML is solid, um, which a lot of, you know, Drupal themes are, are good to go, um, it's mostly to address problem areas. So, you know, if you want to see if you've got problem areas, go back to your computer and turn on that readme by website, you know, setting on your, on your computer and you can kind of, you can pick up on things pretty quickly. Um, so how do we handle dynamic UI content, like expanding or collapsible sections or floating buttons. Um, although certain sections are visible because the content is code, some screen readers may or may not see it. Yeah, so this goes into, you know, there are a ton of different screen readers out there and they kind of vary in their capability. So um, some of the older ones may not know how to interpret JavaScript um, which is what kind of handles that interaction on your site. Um, so if, if you have all of the content on your page, you can structure it in a way that a screen reader without JavaScript could understand it. Um, but if something is being loaded from another site or, um, you know, you've got pages of content, um, something like that is a little bit tricky. Um, there are some ARIA labels that you can add to kind of indicate, hey, this section is going to update. Um, or you can throw kind of like an event saying like, hey, screen reader, pay attention, things have changed. Um, but again, at, at the core, if you've got, you know, something, you know, that's expanding and collapsing, likelihood is there's a header and there's a section of content inside of it. Um, so using a header tag and using, you know, a section tag can kind of help the user when they're being read the site to understand kind of what where things are, um, you know, labeling your buttons expand and collapse, not just, you know, some little cute arrow or something like that, um, can also help them to interact with the site. Um, but it goes back to, you know, solid uh, markup, or sorry, solid HTML to begin with semantic, um, semantic HTML. Um, it, it does get tricky, and it, it really, it's hard to target specific screen readers. Um, as web developers, we always run into, but I'm on, I, you know, Internet Explorer 8. And it's like, oh, that's not going to work very well. Um, you know, people are getting better about updating their browsers. Screen readers uh, can be kind of expensive because it's a piece of software that you use. Um, so people don't update them very regularly. Um, so you need to kind of know, um, you know, what you're going for, you know, which ones you're going to target and prioritize. Um, but again, at the core of it, Good HTML should you know should be accessible kind of out of the box, ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, one of the uh, WCAG level A requirements talks about automatically changing um, the site language based on the browser's language. Um, is this common? And just generally on on the level A's, how common is the adoption um, of those, and how would somebody go about prioritizing them? So I guess I'm I'm not super familiar with that requirement in particular, which makes me think that it's not super common. <laughs> um, I would imagine that that kind of, you know, making sure that you're using language that's familiar to your user in their um, in their current environment. So, so maybe it's referring to something like um, if somebody is familiar with legal jargon, you know, maybe you can use legal jargon more comfortably versus if you're dealing with somebody who's, you know, in their in their environment is not dealing with legal, you know, terms very frequently. Um, you know, you might need to change the complexity of your language or which language you use. Um, I'm not I'm not entirely familiar with changing it per device. Um, that's a little bit odd, um, in my opinion. But um, you know, it might be something like. You know, a Mac uses expand and collapse versus Windows uses open and close. You know, something like that might be um, mm -hmm. something you could look at. You know, using as many familiar cues as possible um, helps your users to understand. So, um, 
and, and something like that, you could probably look at your analytics um, for your website, you know, something like Google Analytics or something like that, um, to see what kind of browsers people are using. That would also indicate if they're using free readers <coughs> where they're using. Um, mm -hmm. What browsers, you know, what, how big their, you know, window is, <laughs> if they're on a mobile device or, or a desktop. Um, you can kind of get some clues there um, to see kind of what your users look like from a, um, from a browser perspective, you know, when they come there. Are there any other questions? Um, yeah, there's a, a, a few other comments on the color current contrast um, stuff. Um, wanting to, um, I'm trying to parse this. Um, I'd like to see examples of color contrast that show um, the best examples um, as positive instead of negative text. As the, um, we know that dark on pale background is more readable than reverse. I think I'm getting that through correctly. Um, I don't know. We've got a, a, I think I've made it through substantively all of the questions that were here. Um, and I've taken some of the comments also um, and redistribute those out um, to the complete group. So, yes, yeah, sure. I think we've got the comments. For the color contrast, um, we just did that because our slides were white, so we wanted to show <laughs> a light color on top of that white background. Um, I think that the, the problem um, likely comes into play a lot more. Like if you've got a primary brand color, for example, that's like blue, um, you know, do you use gray text on it? Do you use black text on it? Do you use white text on it? Um, it all depends on kind of what that shade is. Um, and usually brand colors are not super bright or super dark, but kind of somewhere in the middle, which makes it, you know, tricky to figure out, you know, which way do you skew, um, mm -hmm. lighter or darker. Um, so that's, I think that that's usually the problem that we run into. Um, sometimes, you know, there's a, a very light blue text that somebody has for their brand color, and we think, like, oh, let's use that for links, but, you know, when it's really small, it's very difficult to read. Um, so I think that, you know, the squint test can really help kind of identify some of those issues early on, but there are so many testers out there for color contrast um, that you can run through. And sometimes it's just as simple as speaking it a little bit darker or putting it on a lighter background or something like that um, can really help it out. Excellent. I, I think that covers all the substantive questions. Um, I've got a link that I'm dropping in here, um, which is to the YouTube channel. We should have the video up um, along with a transcript and slides um, here within about a week or so. Um, thank you so much for coming out and putting this on. Um, any last words or last tips before we head out? Uh, no, we just wanted to mention that, you know, I'll, I'll put our contact information up on here. If if anyone has any questions that kind of come up later, that you think of later, or didn't get a chance to ask, please feel free to reach out to either of us or to Ryan Gold broadly, and, you know, we're happy to, to answer any questions that come up. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you all. Greatly appreciate it.